This is Newsable brought to you by BNZ. Let's find a way. So uh, did you see the US-Sweden game? I fell asleep, I'll admit, but yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it was a, a bit late. Pitch. It's a bit late for a school night. Yeah, it was a great game. Oh my God, unbelievable. What a penalty shootout. But um, afterwards, as you do, I was so hyped up on adrenaline that I was just Googling Sweden and reading about Sweden. And um, I read about this Swedish performance art project, uh, which sounds awesome. Basically, um, the artists are paying somebody to do nothing. They're taking applications um, for people who will receive a salary of about two thousand four hundred US dollars per month, plus annual wage increases, vacation time off, and a pension for retirement, uh, to do nothing. They have to go to a train station at a certain time every day, as any commuter would, and they have to go to a place and and clock in, um, and then they also have to clock out. But in between, they don't do anything. They do no work. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. At all. Yeah, and so it's like commentary on the laboriousness of the working world. If you were paid $2,400 a month to do nothing all day, what would you do all day? If I'm not allowed to do anything, I can't do anything. Well, I think you can do whatever you want. You just don't have to do anything for work. And I don't think that you can make money from work. I just play Candy Crush. You play Candy Crush? Yeah, for eight hours. <laughs> You'd be the first person ever to clock Candy Crush. What did you? Yeah. What would you do? I'd probably cook. Might watch Friends um, again. <laughs> Great show. Yeah, actually, there's plenty I could do. Uh, can you send me the link to <laughs> this? <laughs> I can. I will send you an application form as well. I think I would be very good at doing nothing. <laughs> anyway, to the show. Kia ora, this is Newsboy. I'm Emil. And I'm Imogen. And this is what's worth talking about. All Black legend Jeff Wilson joins us to unpack this year's Rugby World Cup squad. Also, the cost of living crisis has touched pretty much every product you can think of except, it seems, illicit drugs. We check in with an expert as to why. Later this year, Aotearoa will elect its bird of the century. But on the list of contenders are a few names you might not recognise. So we'll explain why. And we always aim to help here on Newsball, but am I reckon she's found the most unhelpful list ever written? Ways to have fun without breaking the bank. We've got all that coming up in a moment here on Newsable. First, though, let's check in with Jess for the latest headlines and what's making news today. Kia ora, Emil. It's been another big night of football with two favourites booking a ticket to the quarterfinals overnight. England survived a red card to one of their star players to beat Nigeria in a penalty shootout. And Australia have continued their resurgent form, beating Denmark 2-0. The last games of the round of 16 take place tonight. Back home and two teenagers are facing charges for assaulting men who they lured off a dating site in Christchurch. But police believe there are more perpetrators and victims. They say there have been several incidents where men were contacted on a dating site and assaulted when they arrived at their agreed location. Overseas and Ukraine says it's foiled an assassination plot against President Vladimir Zelensky. Ukraine said it caught a woman red-handed as she was trying to pass intelligence to Russia and was able to foil a targeted airstrike on Zelensky's location. And in ironic news of the day, Zoom has ordered its employees back into the office. The conference call company, made famous during the pandemic, said it believes a hybrid model is best, with employees showing up in person at least twice a week. Those are your headlines for Tuesday Ratu. Ka kite a popo. I know we're in the midst of FIFA fever, but we are also now just 33 days out from the Rugby World Cup 2023, and Ian Foster has named his final All Blacks squad. Joining us now to unpack everything is All Black royalty, Jeff Wilson. Kia ora, Jeff. Welcome to Newsable. Kia ora. I'm not sure about royalty. Just oh. hanging in there as best I can, doing the job we can, but I tell you what, it's been a long wait. I, I don't know how many sides I've picked in 2023. From the moment Super Rugby started, every week you sort of throw up another number, you know, and, and we're finally there, we've arrived. And look, ultimately it's ended up being reasonably predictable, right? Um, mm. A lot of the familiar faces, uh, you know, we, we tried to find room for a couple of extras, a couple of different names, but look, I think everyone that's made the squad thoroughly deserves the opportunity to get on the plane. Is this a World Cup winning squad though? Well, I'm not going to tell you that's going to win the World Cup, but it's certainly good enough. And that, that's the most important thing, is we know we're going with a side that could not just compete, but is going to go over there and is good enough on its day to beat anyone. 
And what we've started to see in 2023 is a side that can do it on back-to-back weeks in multiple mm. games. Jeff, if you take off your patriotism hat and put on your rugby analyst hat, brutal and cool and surgical, what do you consider to be our strengths and our weaknesses heading into this tournament? I think the, the most important thing that's happened is what we've seen up front and our ability uh, in our tight five at scrum time and in the darker arts of the game, the mall, what we've seen is some youth, um, uh, almost a changing of the guard in, in uh, Ethan De Groot and Tyrell Lomax. Uh, they've brought a, a whole different intensity w- to what we do up front. Look, their challenges, there's no doubt. You need to stay healthy. You need an element of good luck. You want, I suppose, some good fortune in regards to some refereeing and TMOs and decisions that happens throughout the course of the competition and, and the tournament. But I think you can say when we look at this group with his experience, it'll be in their own hands because they'll have the ability to adapt and it's just a matter of whether or not they can do it consistently in the big games. Jeff, I want to take you back to a certain period of time. It's 1993. Meatloaf was top of the charts. I was about three weeks old. A meal had just turned two. And a fresh-faced, golden-haired 19-year-old Jeff Wilson was waiting to hear if he'd made the all-black squad to tour Britain. What was it like hearing your name called? In those days, there was no internet. There was no... Look, the, the, it was a case where they wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up. So they sort of told your team, and yes, Meat Life was number one, and <laughs> rightfully so as well. I found out the night before, I had to do the whole collect call home, the old 010. <laughs> oh, please. Will you take the charges? You know? Did they? Was about, did they? Yeah, and they did, funnily That's enough. Good. It, it, was, it was almost like 10, 11 o'clock at night that I found out that I was in the site. No one's open. There's no media open at that time. There's no posting mm. on, on social media. It mm. was a matter of they would name the squad. And I was so naive. Here's how naive I was to who was in the team. I didn't realise that, and I work with him a lot now, I didn't even realise that it was Sir John Kerwin's jersey that I'd taken. Yeah. I, showed up to the, I showed up to the first training and I asked, where's JK? And uh, <laughs> no, no, he's not in the team. Oh, dear. Not a great start, to be fair. Um, but, look, it's remarkable. I, I think ultimately when you, you know you're in a squad that's going, and it's a whole different mindset. You know, for, for half of this team, I think Ian Foster said, half of this team haven't been to a Rugby World Cup. The good thing for us is the other half have. Thank you so much for your time, Jeff Wilson, Sky Rugby commentator and presenter of The Breakdown. Hey, we're still going to talk about the most crucial election of this year. Of course, I'm talking about October's Bird of the Century competition. But while you're here, if you are enjoying what you're hearing, chuck us a like and a follow on your favourite podcast platform. It'll help other people find us and it'll mean you get fresh episodes delivered right to your phone. No issues. No hassle. We've heard a lot over the past few months about the soaring cost of pretty much everything, but it turns out there's one genre of products that's bucking the trend. I'm talking, of course, about illicit drugs. Uh, Believe it or not, according to Massey University's Drug Trends Survey, the price of both cannabis and methamphetamine has actually dropped over the past five years. Massey's Chris Wilkins is the team leader of this project and he's here to chat to us a bit more about it. Kia ora, Chris. Welcome to the pod. Kia ora. Yeah, nice to be here. So is there increased supply of meth and cannabis at play here or simply is it fewer people trying to get their hands on it? We have two different stories here because cannabis and methamphetamine are very different markets, um, Mm. particularly in the New Zealand context where we almost grow all our cannabis locally, whereas methamphetamine increasingly is largely imported from overseas, but there is some local production. In in the case of cannabis, probably not a lot has changed in terms of levels of cultivation and how much has been cultivated, but our hypothesis for the slight decline in price is that the slightly less enforcement pressure. So, you know, you're probably aware that we've now got a medicinal cannabis scheme. Uh, The government changed the Misuse of Drugs Act, so people in possession of small amounts don't ordinarily get arrested. And also there's been this large-scale debate about what we should do with cannabis given the legalisation of cannabis in the US, Canada, and most likely Germany next. So with meth, it's a slightly different story that there's been this massive increase in synthetic amphetamines, uh, production, 
all through the Asian region, but also in the Americas and the Middle East as well. Chris, you talk about how you know cannabis is is maybe an area where law enforcement is, is pulled back in New Zealand a, a little bit. You would think that at least some of those resources of law enforcement would go into cracking down on meth. And indeed, I think we, we, we saw a massive meth drug bust just a couple of months ago. Yet this seems to have not really had much effect on supply and, and price. For, for cannabis, I mean, and this is the quite interesting thing about if you're interested also in cannabis law reform, is a lot of the cannabis enforcement, that low-level enforcement, you know, is pretty convenient kind of thing. So they'd arrest you for something else or they'd stop your car that search it and that find a little bit of cannabis. So it wasn't really highly directed drug enforcement. The fact that they don't do that so much anymore really doesn't um, free up much resources to do anything else, you know, to focus more on meth. And then what more or what should we be doing in the meth space? You mentioned we've got this massive supply of it. Prices are going down. It doesn't seem like we've got a handle on it. The first thing we want to do is prioritise what do we want to focus on? And it seems to me pretty clear that it's going to be methamphetamine and that's pretty much what all the agencies have done. So I guess I would be saying, you know, rebalance up the money you spend because at the moment, you know, 80% or more is spent on supply reduction, whereas all the budget you had, you should add to the other side, demand reduction, and then hope that over time you're able to communicate the risk and you're able to get people with problems away from supply and into drug treatment. Chris Wilkins from Mercy University, thanks very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks. We've got a, well, an interesting, I suppose, list of uh, super cheap ways to have fun, which we will read out a bit later. But naturally, we want to know your tips, super cheap ways to have fun. Get in touch with us. You can find us on Insta or TikTok. Just search up Newsable NZ. And if you have a mighty list that won't fit on the screen, you can send us an email, newsful at stuff.co.nz. Your future is yours to shape, but sometimes you need a helping hand along the way. Whatever it is you imagine for yourself, the Bank of New Zealand is here to help you mould it. Together, let's find a way. Everyone is familiar with my fondness for the kākāpō, and by extension, the Bird of the Year competition, because it gives me an excuse to talk about how awesome those green, chonky things are. And this year, I'm very excited, because in 2023, we aren't just selecting Bird of the Year, we're selecting Bird of the Century. Century. Sounds good, doesn't it? It's got gravitas. Yeah, Forest and Bird, which uh, runs the competition, is celebrating its centenary this year and thought electing a bird of the century would be a fitting way to mark it. But there are some unusual candidates in this particular competition. Here to explain why is Forest and Bird's chief executive, Nicola Toki. You do realise that this is the best way to stoke a full-on civil war in Aotearoa, <laughs> New Zealand. Uh, I'm surprised you've even invited me onto, onto the show, given your fondness. Uh, for the big green budgies, because we actually booted them out of the competition last year for just being too popular. It's actually why I got you here, Jay yeah. Nicola. <laughs> New penance, yeah. Looking through the list of candidates, obviously the classics there, um, but people might also notice some unfamiliar names there: the uh, Ma Tui Tui, the Tutu Kiwi, the Huya, the Pio Pio, the Fairco. Can you explain why those names might not be familiar? to some people. Yeah, so there are 75 birds that people can vote for in, the, you know, the most important election of the year, in our view. Mm -hmm. But we've mm -hmm. added five that have been classified as extinct, but within the last 100 years. At the moment, 82% of all New Zealand's bird species are threatened with extinction. And so we want the public who love our competition to both be motivated and inspired and have a few laughs, as they always do. But we want to be clear about what we're dealing with here in terms of what's at stake. So that's why they've been added to the list. And also we don't want them to be forgotten. Because conservation is the entire undertone behind Bird of the Year, right? It, like you even just said, it's a fun, silly competition, giggle, 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 but actually we do have a serious problem. We have a major problem. I mean, and part of the problem is this. So 
Uh, we're really good at telling good news stories in New Zealand about our bird fauna, right? And we, we, you get to the end of any TV news weekend story and there'll be some lovely group releasing a kiwi and we all think that's great. But what we don't get is that in areas, for example, where there's no pest control in New Zealand, 19 out of 20 uh, North Island brown kiwi chicks don't survive to one year of age. And that is a fast track to extinction. So if you think about the way we um, value nature in New Zealand we value these birds, we pay about $29 million per year to protect threatened birds in New Zealand, which is nearly all of them. That's roughly what IRD wanted to spend on doing up their Wellington office this month. Mm. So I think we're out of whack with the stuff that we value deep in our hearts and that we really think is worth protecting and then what we chuck at it in terms of looking after it. The competition is in October. Are you keen to come out, plant your flag in the ground? and endorse any bird at this early stage? I mean, it's early, right? It's real early. I'm not ready. Not like top five? Yeah. Typical chief executive response there. <laughs> you know, we'll get a we'll get a straight answer from you uh, later on in the campaign, I'm sure. I mean, it's like, this is why I only have one child, because I, I can't pick a favourite. <laughs> <laughs> Nicola Toki from Forest and Bird, thanks very much for your time and your work on this campaign. Thanks for having me. This is Newsable, brought to you by BNZ. Let's find a way. Anytime I see an article or a piece of content that promises to help me save money, you know I'm going to click on it in this cost of living crisis. But the other day I clicked on an article from the National Public Radio in the States, NPR, titled 10 Ways to Have Fun Without Breaking the Bank. I was excited. I was intrigued. Mm. It had some of the strangest... And dare I say, worst suggestions I've ever come across. <laughs> it's a great teaser. There's a, there's a, you're going to have to walk me through this. Oh, do one not one worry. Have. I have uh-huh. them right here. I'll take you through them all. Not all of them were bad. And so that's why I'm going to read out all 10. Maybe it'll help mm-hmm. someone. Okay. Number one, check your local paper or try searching events near me on Google and see if there's any free ones or cheap ones. Sure. <laughs> it's number one. Number two. That was yeah. number one. Number two, go to the park. Just go to the park. Go to the park. Number two. Go to the park. Why do you say have fun without breaking the bank? Go to the park. I mean, yeah. Just go to the park, yeah. Number three, go on a penny date. Penny date. And then it goes into detail. You take a coin, assign left and right to either side of the coin. So heads are left, tails are right. Uh And you go to a part of town you're not familiar with (laughs) and then you flip a coin at every intersection (laughs) and, quote, go on an adventure. That gives me the ick. It feels like someone's trying yeah. to be too cool or too cute. Number four, try a food challenge. Now, the suggestion here was to buy a bunch of different chippies from different brands but same flavour. Now, you know how I feel about chip prices, and that certainly will break the bank in this New Zealand cost of living crisis, so I do not mm-hmm. recommend trying to buy loads of chippies and doing a food challenge. Number five, host an art night at home. Okay. Not mad about that one. Wait, so like an art night is then everybody comes around and they paint something or draw something? Yeah, just grab some cra- like cheap crafts. Are you good at art? I feel like you'd be terrible. good at Terrible. In really? year 10, the art teacher held up one of my pieces of art and laughed at it. Really? Same. In front of the class. As well. In front of the class. All right, so that was number five. That was number five. five. Number yep. six is one of the ones where I was like, I'm sorry, what did I just read? Number six, use your imagination. That's number six. Number six is Num- use your imagination. Number six is use your imagination. Just use it. so patronising. Just use your imagination, Emil, for a bit of, <laughs> for, 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 to, to not break the bank this weekend, you and you and Jim, just use your imagination. Number seven, throw a movie marathon. Fine. Yeah. Number okay. eight, go to a museum. Love that. Don't do it enough. Need to do it more often. Thank you. See, this list is somewhat, somewhat helpful. <laughs> Number nine, another doozy, make up a game. Just make one up. Just make up a game. <laughs> just make a game. Make up a game. Just make a game up. Number 10 also baffles me. Uh, house swap with a friend. Whoa. Or they that say escalated this one, quickly. Yeah, they say this one's a low-cost alternative to taking a full-fledged vacation. Gives me mad Marie Antoinette vibes. Marie Antoinette vibes. <laughs> Number six, telling me to use my imagination is the 2023 version of Let the Meat Cake. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, of course, we want your ways to have fun without breaking the bank. Uh, we'll have something up on the old Instagram, but you can also email us, newsable at stuff.co.nz. That's newsable for today, though. I'm Imogen Wells. And I'm Emil Donovan. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll catch you tomorrow. Use your imagination.
that was Newsable, brought to you by BNZ. Let's find a way.